just your friendly reminder that whenever we generally are sitting before an electronic screen, we are passive receivers of information and entertainment, but worship is not supposed to be like that. So I encourage you to participate in these songs, in these prayers, in the message time. I even encourage children, you're listening right now as well, I know, children, teenagers, listen to me. I encourage you to listen. I don't buy into the cultural lie that you're too stupid to get all this. I think you are highly intelligent. Truth be known, you're smarter than a lot of your parents. So, you can get this information. Don't tell your parents I said that though. All right, 1 John. 1 John, if you would please, turn with me. 1 John chapter 2. So, I guess it was around 1,700 years ago, there was a missionary that performed an act and did something, and because of this missionary's life and because of his service, today he is the only missionary in the world that actually has a holiday named after him. Patrick was born in A.D. 3. 73 in what we today call Scotland. His father was a deacon. Christianity had made it to these, the British Isles by this point. We believe that there was a man named Augustine, not the Augustine that I quoted earlier, but another Augustine that made it up into this area and brought Christianity up into what we call today the British Isles. So Patrick's father was a deacon at church, and his grandfather was actually a priest or a pastor at a church. When pastor, or Patrick rather, was 16 years old, raiders, pirates, descended onto his little village, his town, and they started to raid and plumage and torch the city, torch the village. They torched his home. And he ran off to hide from the pirates, but they found him, and they seized him, and they hauled him aboard their ship and took him back to what we call today Ireland. And it was there in Ireland, when Patrick was a slave, that he actually became a follower of Jesus Christ. Later on, after being in slavery for quite some time, he was able to escape Ireland and make it back home to Scotland. And his parents, as you can imagine, were overjoyed that he actually came back and they never wanted him to leave again. But one night, so goes the story, Patrick had a dream. And in this dream, he claims that there was an Irish man pleading for Patrick to come back to Ireland. Again, this is the place where he was just enslaved, that he escaped from, pleading that he would come back to Ireland and evangelize Ireland. Well, as you can imagine, his family did not want him to even think about doing something like this, but Patrick believed that this dream or vision was some sort of message from God, and so he went. He only carried a Latin Bible with him. He went back to Ireland And it was difficult. The main superstitious sort of mythological religion at that time in Ireland was the Druids, was the Druid religion. And they opposed him. They tried to kill him. They sought to eradicate his message from this area. But Patrick persisted. And he became one of the most fruitful evangelists of all time, and especially in that time it appears that he planted something like 200 churches in Ireland and baptized over 100,000 individuals. And his work seemed to endure, because we know that the church there in the British Isles continued on even until today. Well, because of Patrick's work, And it was probably a couple of hundred years after him, but it may have been shortly after his lifetime. There was a hymn that was written by the ancient church. 
It's a hymn that you probably know really well. We actually sang it here last week, Be Thou My Vision. A woman by the name of Mary Bryan, who was a scholar in Ireland, found this. They claim, many claim, that this was actually written in the 8th century, but there may be some debate about it could have been written earlier. We don't know. But she translated it. And the reason that I'm bringing all of this up, Patrick's work in Ireland, how this hymn came about because God working through that, is because I want to note the first verse here in Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. In other words, all I want is you. Thou my best thought by day and by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. This morning, in my message, what I would like to do is talk about abiding in the light. Abiding in this presence of the light. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does John have to tell us about that? So if you will, look with me. Again, this is 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 11. If you would, please stand with me in honor of reading God's word, starting at verse 7. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. And we're going to talk about what that is here in a moment. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him that is in Christ and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother, abides in the light. And in him, there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's say a prayer. Holy Father, we want to be ever sitting at your feet, abiding in you, abiding in the light. Help us, Lord, to be individuals that abide in you and that your grace pours out of us, is manifested in us, because the Spirit of God reigns in us. Help us to be in the light, abide in the light, walk in the light, and love those in the light. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, so let me give you my message this morning here in one sentence. My message here in a A nutshell, if you will. Here it is. And then I'm going to start walking through this passage with some thoughts drawing out from our passage here. My main point is, obeying the commandment of love is a major indicator that one is abiding in the light. It's not the only indicator, but it is a indicator or an indicator here. So obeying the commandment of love is a major indicator that one is abiding in the light here. And it's important that we note this here with 1 John. You probably instinctively have sort of registered this anyways, but though Chuck and I take out pieces of you know, the scripture to preach every single Sunday morning, and that's, that's good, and that's the way that we have to do it, keep in mind that The way John writes, there's a lot of pieces that just sort of fit together from preceding messages, all the way back to my message last year when I talked about the fellowship of the light, and going back especially to Chuck's message last week where we show that we indeed are in the light 
whenever we keep his commandments. Today, what I want to do is I want to walk through this passage, and I want to highlight some thoughts that I have here showing how it is that we, follow me here, that we represent Christ in our lives by manifesting Christ's nature in our actions. And I know that may sound, sound a bit esoteric and weird, but I'm hoping by the time we get to the end of this message here that you'll understand what I am saying. So let's jump in here. The first thought that I have here regarding our passage is this. Commandments are not a bad thing. Commandments are not a bad thing. Look with me here. Beloved, I'm going to come back to that phrase here in just a moment. I am writing, or that word, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment. Now we're going to talk about what these commandments are in a minute, but right up front, what I want to note here is, is that commandments are not bad. <laughs> I know that sometimes in Christianity and just in life in general, we tend to think of rules and guidelines and commandments is some sort of bad thing, but they're not bad. If they were, Jesus wouldn't be giving them to us. John wouldn't be giving them to us. Commandments are good. Rules are actually good. And to be quite honest with you, though, sometimes I think we may rebel against authority. Sometimes we may, you know, disdain certain commands and rules, ultimately, I think we all appreciate them. And I can highlight that by taking any sort of sporting event. If there, was, if there were no rules in the game of football, I mean, it can already get pretty violent and chaotic as it is. Can you imagine? Just It would be utter chaos. If, if there were no rules in baseball, it, it, there wouldn't even be a system to it. It wouldn't be enjoyable to watch. It'd be just a bunch of people throwing and hitting and doing craziness. Look, take even probably one of the most violent sports in America, and that is the ultimate fighting. Even in the ultimate fighting, there are rules, there are regulations that you must abide by. So we all appreciate rules. If you've ever been to a foreign country and driven in a foreign country or rode in a car in a foreign country, there are many foreign countries in which drivers don't respect the rules or the laws of the road like we generally do here in America. I'll be the first to admit that there are some individuals in America that don't seem to abide by the rules or obey and are bad drivers. Fair enough. But there are some places that I've been where individuals, they seem to act as if there are no laws of the road at all. And they go where they want to go, drive how they want to drive, as fast as they want to, as chaotic as they want to. And it's extremely dangerous. I appreciate that we have laws. Granted, there may be times where I wish the speed limit was higher than it actually is, or I wish someone would speed up that's going slow in front of me, something like that. But overall, I appreciate the rules, it keeps me safe, it gets me where I want to go, it keeps others safe, it helps me save money so I don't have to pay for car repairs, etc. Rules are not a bad thing. I think we instinctively know that, but we at times push against particular rules that we generally don't like. And let me note something here with that. It seems to be inbred within Americans, and I'm, and I'm Picking on us because I am you. It seems to be inbred in us to rebel against authority. We generally approach any authority, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a parent, whether it be a politician, whether it be a police officer, whatever, whoever it may be, a boss, we generally approach authorities with certain skepticism and sometimes even disdain. Questioning authorities is, seems to be our default. In fact, even in America, we have the stereotypical teenage rebellion, rebel, right? I mean, it's not even like it's a rare thing to te see teenage rebels. It's almost as if it's sort of facilitated in our teenagers at times because of our culture of questioning authority. Now, should we obey authority just blindly? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you should not obey any authority blindly. That's true. But the other extreme is also, I think, detrimental to us. 
Whenever we're questioning authority, whether it be a God-given authority, whenever we question authority that maybe we are you know, uh, a, a, a working under at that time, when we do that, I think what we are manifesting is pride in our own lives, of thinking that we know better than others, that we're smarter than everybody else. Everybody else is dumb. My authorities don't know what they're talking about, but I do. So you guys should all listen to me. And then the crowd behind, yeah, let's follow him for about five minutes. Then they start questioning him because he's now the authority. Leaders tend to always be individuals that are in the line of fire. It's just the nature of being a leader. But I think we need to be careful as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, listen. I think we need to be careful in questioning our authority. Granted, we don't need to follow them blindly. That is also bad. But we don't need to be skeptical and approach them with a default mode of, they're probably wrong about this, but I'm just going to go along with it till I can prove it. I don't think that's good either. And it's that mindset at times in our culture that brings us to the understanding that I don't like rules. And hey, I've been told many times that Christianity is just this simple little system where I can make up what I want to do and follow Jesus how I want to. It's a relationship after all, and I can set the boundaries and the rules of this relationship. But our God is a God of order, not of chaos. Our God is a God that has set up particular systems and particular orders to not only approach him and know him, but the way that we are supposed to live and live a good, flourishing life. And if we're questioning authority, questioning rules, questioning commandments all of the time, or disobeying them, what's going to happen to us? Ultimately, is we're going to be living a prideful life and we're not going to be close to God because we won't have that humble spirit. And notice John here before I walk on to, or go to the next point here. Notice at the very beginning of verse 7, notice what he says. He says, beloved. So John here is actually saying the ones I love, in other words, you that I love, obey not a new commandment here, but an old commandment. So John is actually showing that he's obeying the commandment as he is telling them to follow the same thing. And notice here as we keep on going. Notice here in verse 1. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, and I'll get to this in just a moment, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. So John is saying here, this is an old commandment that you've had from the beginning. What commandment is he talking about? Because he doesn't detail it right here. But I read it to you during the announcement time. I think John is talking about the commandment that Jesus gives in John 13 at the Last Supper. When he says that you are to love one another. Here, John is saying, this isn't a new commandment. You've heard it before. But notice this. Whenever you kind of... Let me back up and say it with me. Whenever I used to read this passage and, and come across this idea of this, that there's this old commandment, usually the way I read this is, oh, because John is writing to a church that he's ministered to before, and he's taught them this commandment. So he's not saying anything new. He's saying the same thing he's already said. He's just sort of repeating himself, which is a, a good leadership trait, a good communication trait to repeat yourself so people get it. But I don't think that's actually what John is saying here upon further study. I think John is actually going far deeper with this statement. This is an old command, uh, commandment that you have had from the beginning. The commandment here to love isn't old. Or excuse me, isn't new rather. It's old, but it doesn't just go back to the time of Moses. This commandment to love goes all the way back to the beginning of creation itself. And the reason that we hold that is, is because the reason we love is not just to sort of get something else from another. In other words, true love is not I scratch your back and you scratch mine. We love 
as followers of Jesus Christ because God is love and we want to reflect the nature of God. We want to reflect God to the world. In other words, we want to glorify God through our lives. So we love not because we want to get something from it necessarily, but we love because we love God and we want to show others God. So this isn't something novel that's, that John is given here. And Jesus really isn't giving something novel when he said, love one another. And the apostles aren't giving anything novel when they say, love one another. Love is something that is actually grounded in the very character and nature of God. And since it is grounded in the character and the nature of God, it isn't new, it's extremely old, it's extremely ancient because God is eternal. He doesn't have a beginning. Now I know in our society, in our day, we place an extremely high value on new things because of its marketability or material value. But here, John, is actually hearkening to something that is very ancient. And because it is ancient, it has some authority. Let me draw this out more. I actually have to talk about this quite a bit in my intro to ethics class. Why is it that we obey or do right things? For example, when growing up, my mom or dad would say, Chad, you need to clean your room. Now, why do I do that? I do that because they're my authority, right? And my dad is, he owns a house, he and mom own the house, and since they're the owners of the house and they're my parents, they have this authority, and when they tell me to do something, I should do it, okay? But let's say that my parents come to me now, I don't live in their house, I haven't lived in their house for quite some time, I guess almost 20 years, and now mom tells me, Chad, you should pay your taxes. Why should I listen to her? I'm no longer in her household. Why should I pay my tax? Just because she says it? Or what if mom says you should pay your taxes because your grandmother says it? Okay, granny is a little older, but what does she have? Why, does, why should I do what she says? Or what if she said you should pay your taxes because brother Charlie says to do that? Okay. I like Chuck. He's a good guy. I listen to him a lot. But what does it matter what he says about this? And let's keep going on and on. The government says, the, the, the authorities say, why should we listen to all of these individuals? See, ultimately, if our following of ethics, if our morality is grounded just on what human beings say, then it is a relativistic subjective morality, and it could change from day to day, from age to age. That's why 250 years ago, they had no problem owning slaves, because they understood it as some sort of subjective means. But you and I today know that when they owned slaves 250 years ago, that was an immoral act. So how is it today that we can come and we can say, you should obey this commandment, love one another, John is actually making an extremely profound theological and philosophical statement here because what John is saying is, is that morality, right and wrong, ethics are not grounded in what human beings think or what human beings want or what human beings long for or what the president says or what the Congress says or what a judge says or what any philosopher says or any theologian says or any pastor says or any human being we ground our morality in the nature and the character of God. And because of that, because of that, we're tapping into something extremely ancient. So why should I love one another? Not because mom tells me to, she does, but not because of that. Not because my authorities tell me to, not because pastors tell me to, not because teachers tell me to. I'm supposed to love one another because God tells me to. And that characteristic is coming out of him. And when I do it, I'm showing others. Hey, you wanna see Christ? You wanna see God? Let me show him to you by the way that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how I'm glorifying God. That's how I'm reflecting who God is. 
So this very commandment of loving God or loving one another here, and we do it grounded upon God, is actually an extremely deep, profound statement. Ever ancient, and yet, as we see here, also ever new. Look with me here in verse 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. Okay, wait, 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 John. You just said it's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment. And now you're telling me it's new. What is going on here? John speaks in these sort of paradoxical terms at times. But what John is getting at is something really, really important. John is highlighting here that we should obey God and should love one another because it is grounded and rooted in the nature of God. And, here's the second part. Listen to me now. And, it is a new commandment in that you can only love as you are commanded to love when the grace of God is upon your life. So it's not until the grace of God is being poured out in the person of Jesus by the Holy Spirit that you are able to obey what it is that God tells you to do. In other words, when Jesus came and he lived the life of perfect love, he was an example for us. He was a way maker for us. And when we see Jesus doing it, now we know what perfect love looks like. We have an exemplar. We have an example that we can follow. So not only are we supposed to love because God tells us to, but we are supposed to love because we see Jesus doing it. And keep in mind here, this love isn't some superficial emotional reaction toward people. But it's it's something deeper. It's some sort of deeper affection toward individuals, a genuine affection that reflects the glory of God. And it is done in this disposition of intending to show the love of God. It is a disposition that is an overflow from where our hearts truly are, and thus genuine agape love, which is the type of love that John is talking about here. Genuine agape love can only come as a product of God's grace. So we are supposed to follow God's commandments, why? Because he tells us to love here and love is grounded in Christ, but we can only do that because God gives us the grace to do that. Something, an application that needs to be noted here, an important application. Parents, listen to me. It is a a good and right thing when we look at our children and see that they have some significant character flaws that need to be ironed out and we want to get them into church. I've heard it tons of times, right? You have to. My kid has some problems, and it's just time that I get them back into church. And usually the problems are these significant character flaws. They're doing things that they shouldn't, whether it be against the law or whatever. And in that way, many times parents are looking at church as just simply a place where my kids can just go learn to be Good citizens, good people, have good morals. That mindset and heart is certainly noble. I want my children to act right. I want them to be in church for sure, hanging around the right people so that they will act right when I'm not around or when they get out of the house. I get that. That's that's a noble pursuit. But ultimately, that's not why we get our children in church. And in fact, what I'm saying here and what I think John is saying is, is that they will not act as they should if we have just that mindset. Because here, what I'm seeing John saying is, and what I see other parts of Scripture saying is, to actually live as we are commanded by God to live this good moral life We must be in fellowship with Jesus. And the life of goodness, the righteousness, is a byproduct of being close to Jesus. So we come to church, we want our kids to come to church primarily because we want them to know Jesus. We want them to be reconciled to God. Not just so they'll be good people. Granted, I know you want that as well, but that's not the primary reason we go to church. We go to church because we want our children 
to live the abundant life. We want our children to know God. We want our children to be reconciled to God. And it is at that point when they're tapping into the grace of God or releasing themselves to the grace of God that they actually live as they are called to live. You can't do it any other way. You might have individuals that are following the rules, but they're not going to be what God calls them to be outside of the grace of God. I want my kids to come to church and be a part of church. I teach my kids scripture and the Bible because I want my kids to know Jesus. And when they know Jesus and love Jesus, then that grace pours out of them. They start reflecting that which they hang around. But we're mentioning love a lot here. Let's keep reading for just a moment. At the same time, verse 8 is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. Now, here's a key question before I go on to my next point. What in the world is love? We talk about love a lot in this culture. But in our culture, we almost think of love as like some sort of, some sort of feeling within our stomach. Some sort of, you know, I get the fuzzy feelings in my belly whenever I'm around you. And that we think of that as love. But I don't think that that's a good picture of love. I certainly don't think that that is a biblical picture of love. So when John tells us that we are to love our brothers and sisters here, what does he mean? There are certain theologians and philosophers and thinkers that have told us some stuff here. And I'm going to be using them. But of course, when we're talking about this love here in verse 10, this love again is that agape, agape love, that unselfish or unconditional type of love. Thomas Aquinas claimed that love is willing for another's good. C.S. Lewis said something very similar in his Mere Christianity when he said that loving others is when you are wishing their good, though not feeling fond of them, nor saying he or she is a nice person when they're not. Ultimately, their version of how love is manifested in the life here, which is the point that I really want to harpen on, this type of love is not just a love that you just have within you, and it doesn't show itself. If you truly love, it's going to come out. It's going to show itself in some sort of action. That's important here. So here, when John says, whoever loves his brother, in other words, you're going to be able to see it. You're going to know it. So what is it that you're going to see if someone loves another? I think one thing that you're going to see is something that Lewis is hitting on here when he says that you are wishing for his or her good. His or her good. And granted in scripture we have the passage where it describes what love is, but still yet we want to know how does it show itself. I can say that I love someone, but if I'm not showing it correctly, am I really loving them? Do I actually even know what love is? Lewis writes this, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. I think Lewis is hitting on something here for an interpretation of John. What Lewis is saying is this, by its very nature, when I love, it is going to be shown in my life. When I love, people will know it. If I have a neighbor that I'm not sure if I love them, what I need to do is act like I love them. Just do the things that someone that loves would do. And over time, what that tends to produce by that habit is love. Loving others is always produced, and always rather produces some action. Let me say that again. Loving others always produces some action for others. But as I go, before I go on to my last point, 
Let me note this. Loving others doesn't mean that you overlook sin. Loving others doesn't mean that we ignore wrongdoing. Loving others doesn't mean that we tolerate some abominable, ab um, abhorrent sin or behavior. And loving others doesn't mean that we justify sinful actions. We've got it in our head, in our culture, that love means, well, I tolerate their lifestyle no matter who they are or what they do. That's just not true. No, ultimately, no one does that. Do we tolerate murder in this culture? Do we just simply overlook it? Well, that's just who old Bob is. He's a killer, and so I'm going to love him no matter what. No, that's not what we do. That's how we act. We all have this line. We all have this point of where we're not going to tolerate that act. But ultimately, I think that if love is wishing for the good of another, then the greatest good that we can do for someone is hoping that they come to Christ and are free from the slavery of sin. So if indeed I truly love someone, if I really love them, then I would gently and respectfully tell them when they are doing something that's wrong. It's not necessarily that I throw stones at them or that I yell at them or nothing like I'm not talking about that, but it's not that I'm going to overlook it and say, oh, don't worry about it. Jesus loves you anyways. No, we can't overlook sin like that. There's a certain point where no one overlooks sin like that. If we truly love someone, do we honestly want them to be enslaved to sin that's going to drag their soul to hell for all of eternity? If we truly love someone, do we want them to be beaten and bruised, spiritually speaking, and sometimes physically speaking, because of the sin in their life? If we truly love someone, are we willing just to sit back and smile at them when they're engaging in the acts that they shouldn't, that's, that are harming them and hurting them? I don't think that's love. I honestly think that's pride. It's pride because ultimately we don't want to say anything, and we ignore their 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 aberrant behavior, because we don't want them to think bad of us. That's ultimately what it's doing. Well, I don't want to say anything to them because then they might not, might not like me. Well, I don't want to say anything to them because then they may be mad at me. Look, I'm not talking about being a jerk. Granted, there are times you can go up to someone and, tell, and engage in their, talk to them about their sin, rather, and be a jerk about it. Totally true. If you don't know what that looks like, just get on Facebook for about five minutes, and you'll probably see it. But there are ways that you can gently, lovingly, and respectfully go to individuals and say that this isn't right. God doesn't like this. And I've seen it in my own ministry. I had an individual. When I was in First Baptist Church of Venus, as I transitioned into my final point and conclusion here, that was living in sin, and he came to me and he asked, to join the church. And I had to have that weird, awkward conversation with him, but I did it as lovingly and as gentle as I could and tell him that as long as he's doing this, he can't become a member at First Baptist Church. And it shocked him at first, but he accepted it. I thought that I'd never see him again, but guess what happened the next Sunday? He was there. And guess what happened the day that Holly and I announced that we're resigning from the pastor there? He was the first one to come up and hug me, crying on my shoulder. Don't tell me that you can't gently and respectfully go to people and do it in such a way that you can maintain a good relationship. I've done it. I've seen it. You can. And just FYI, side note with that, Brother Charlie's the best to show that. He is one of the most gentle at doing that. Side note, here we go. Next point. Verse 10. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Love is a light indicator, is my last thought. Now, the question here, as we read this, 
Because, well, let me start, start, start it out like this. Let me say verse 10 and 11 in my own words. Here's what I think they say. If you are truly followers of Christ, you will love your brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that just in a simple way, that's what John is saying in verse 10 and 11 here. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're going to love brothers and sisters in Christ. But the next question, I mean, the thing that clicks in my head is, well, what about those that don't love their brothers and sisters but claim to be Christians? And here's my word to you. When interpreting the Bible, we must interpret it as it is, not as we want it to be. As a preaching minister of the gospel, of the word of God, when I preach, I preach the Bible as it is, not what I want it to say, not what you want it to say. I preach it as it is. Is. Now, granted, there are times when we have to dig to try to figure out what's going on here. Many times we have to do that. But I always want to be faithful to what the text is saying. And it seems clear here, and even all of the, the, the commentaries that I have seem to indicate that John is claiming that those who have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit those that have been born again in Christ will, will love their brothers and sisters in Christ. It is something that is just a byproduct of our salvation. And if you don't love your brother and sister in Christ, my encouragement to you is to go to God and seek God and run to the light. Imagine here in my conclusion, as I'm wrapping up, imagine Jesus healing a blind man, as we know he did many times in scripture. Jesus healing a blind man, and after the blind man could see all the colors and see the world and use that sense to navigate the streets and do everything that it is that we do with sight, imagine that that man that was once blind and now could see decided, hey, you know what? I think that life was better when I was blind and made himself blind again. If a blind man is given sight, he's going to use that sense for his own benefit. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That doesn't mean you always agree with them. That doesn't mean you always like what they're doing. That doesn't mean that you're always kind and polite and let's hold hands here and sing kumbaya and stand around a fire and pray. That's not what I'm saying here. But you will love and that you will wish for their good. And that love will be manifested in your life. Now, here's the question that I want to close with. The last thought, I'm going to say a prayer and Brother Chuck's going to come do the benediction. What if I don't love someone? What does that mean? I am open to thoughts here. So I'm giving you sort of just a, a rough idea of where I'm going with this. But in this text and in scripture, it seems to me that the absence of love is hate. And though there may be a middle ground, I'm open to arguments, I'm open to ideas about that. In Scripture, we're not told some sort of middle ground. It's either you love someone or you hate them. So what does it mean if you don't love them? The absence of love is hate. So let me ask you, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ even when they're unlovable? Do you love them? And if not, what does that mean for you? Let's pray. Father, I pray that this stumbling, bumbling message from this fallible human being will 
pour forth from your word and strike the hearts and minds of all that heard it. I pray, Father, that if I've said anything up here that is untrue, that you will strike it from the memory of those that listen and correct me. But above all, I pray, Lord, that you help us to abide in the light. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Chuck. Thank you, Chad. And as Chad was speaking, I kept getting this recurring picture in my mind of a man standing on the edge of a cliff. And it's a new cliff. There just been a great earthquake. And he's standing at a roadway that once was a roadway, and now then the roadway ends at a straight drop-off. And the man is standing there watching for traffic that might be coming that does not realize that what was once a road is now a cliff. And he sees cars coming. What do you think that man should do? Do you think that he should just sit and smile and wave at them <laughs> as they unknowingly plunge off the cliff? Or do you think that that man should probably do something like say, Stop. Stop. You're going to die. As Chad was preaching, that, that was the picture I just kept getting in my mind when we, if we'd love somebody and we see them heading toward a cliff, do you think we shouldn't find some way to say, stop, stop? I think that would be kind of like love, amen? And maybe you've been heading on a cliff. Now I want to lead us in a prayer. Sometimes we might call it a sinner's prayer. And I've come to realize the um, last several weeks with this um, live streaming, we have a good number of people that are watching on Sunday morning that may not be regular attenders here, may not even be members of our church, may not be a Christian. And I want to lead you in a prayer and, of course, your prayer has to be from your heart to God. And the thing I kind of like about this moment is that you're not going to be trying to impress anybody in your home, in your front room, or in your computer room. As you're, you're not going to be praying to come in front of a crowd of people and to be recognized just between you and God. Could this be the prayer of your heart? So I'm going to lead us in prayer. You pray with me, and then we'll be dismissed. Would pray would be something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I have sinned. And I'm sorry for all my sins. I do believe you love me because I believe you died for my sin. Please forgive me of all my sin. And I don't want to live in sin anymore. I want to turn away from this life that's heading toward a cliff of destruction. Please forgive me. I open my heart to you. I open my life to you. I invite you to come into my heart, into my life. Because I need a Lord, I need a Master, I need a Savior. I 
I need a new life that I know only comes from you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I want to live for you. I want to serve you. For every breath that you give me until the time you call me home. I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I love you, Lord Jesus. Fill my heart with that same love for those around me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless.